How's it going? Episode 24 here. Uh, we have Sham returning. We're talking rubber tramps, train hopping, urban exploring adventures, staying at shelters, and lots more. That's pretty much it. Next episode I'm going to post is probably going to be another uh, reading of Evasion. Going to do part two, the next chapter there. Getting through it is is quite a bit of work, but I'm, I'm slowly hammering at it and hope to get that done within the next week. And yeah, that's all. But first, a word from our sponsor. Introducing the Silencio Switch 3000, your ultimate shut-up solution. Tired of enduring never-ending babble? Wish there was a magic bun to hush those chatterboxes? Well, buckle up, because we've got the answer to your talkative troubles. The Silencio Switch 3000. Unleash the power of silence. Say goodbye to awkward conversations, boring meetings, and unwanted opinions. With just the press of a button, the Silencio 3000 will assertively tell people to shut the fuck up in the most delightful way possible. Finally, a device that understands your need for peace and quiet. Features that will blow your mind. Sleek design. It fits perfectly in the palm of your hand so you can discreetly silence the noise without drawing attention. Customizable responses. Choose from a variety of sassy shut up phrases or record your own personalized message. Get creative. Mood lighting. The Silencio 3000 comes with built-in LED lights that change colors based on your mood because sometimes you just need to express your annoyance with a little flair. Laugh your way to silence. The Silencio 3000 do doesn't just kill silence, it entertains. Turn awkward moments into hilarious memories with its snarky comebacks. Watch as people chuckle while, get while getting the hint to zip it. Testimonials from happy customers. I can finally enjoy my morning coffee in peace, says Sarah P. The Silencio 3000 saved my sanity at family gatherings, says Brian M. Never thought I'd find joy in pressing a button, but here we are, says Emily R. Limited time offer. Order now and we'll throw in a mini megaphone attachment for those moments when silence isn't enough. Act fast because peace of mind is just one button press away. Don't let endless chatter bring you down. Get your Silencio 3000 today and rediscover the beauty of golden silence. Here with Sham back on for the third time. And uh, so last time you mentioned you started rubber tramping. How was that and how was the transition to just living out of a backpack? For me, I think it's the perfect transition. If I were to recommend anything, I would say start off as a rubber tramp, just the convenience of it. I believe you're also able to kind of accelerate your experience in a way. Since you're moving at a quicker rate, you can see more things. And that's what vagabonding is about. It's the experiences. I think you can fit in more experiences that way. Um, so for me, kind of the gripe I have at times is, you know, I mentioned, hey, I've been doing this for two years. Two years is a weird point. It's like it might seem like a lot or it could seem like a little. It really depends on who you're speaking to. But I believe I had, like, in a sense, an accelerated course because of rubber tramping. That's why I would say I recommend it. Being able to go to 40 states across the country six times in the span of a couple of months. And you can, you're moving at such a rate that I can see all these abandoned buildings. I can see all these different scenarios. I can experience different parts of the country, the weather, the climate, the people, the food, all that stuff. I, so I, I really believe, thankfully, I'm blessed to be able to pack a lot of stuff within two years. So 
So when you have people kind of approach you, maybe the older, more bitter type, it's like once you've done something, it's rinse and repeat. You know, I did all my research to jump on a train in Chicago. I did YouTube. I couldn't find nothing on YouTube. Again, it has been done before. I believe it's just a tougher route. So I was able to go through that process myself, educate myself. I took that time. I can hop any train at this point because once you learn how to do it one time, especially I believe in a tougher scenario of figuring out a Chicago to Seattle, all BNSF type route, which again, I couldn't find any info except an article a couple of decades back. I couldn't, I didn't see any video on it. So for me, I'm like, okay, this is perfect. I'm going to start off with, you know, more of a challenge and then go from there. I think once, once you pop a train or two, you pretty much know the, the scenario. You're listening in on the radio for numbers, for destinations. And you're going from there. There's nothing crazy. Whether you hop one or two times or a hundred, sure, you're going to have more experience the more you do it. But it's it's you can't say that person has not done it or doesn't understand it. You know, vice versa with um, the time you put in. Like most of the time, it's dead time. You're you're just kind of living life. There's nothing extreme. If you've been able to camp in all sorts of weather environment, you've been there, done that. Like, there's no more to it. You don't need to be doing years on end in the Antarctic to prove that you're tough. You've survived across X number of years. Like, you get the point. I feel like a lot of times when you talk to some of these maybe older, more bitter types who've settled in and they're reminiscing about the, the good old times, they feel like they're being challenged in a way. And it's like, there's zero challenge about this. I'm when I mention certain things or other people mention certain things about their experiences, it doesn't demean yours. I feel like a lot of people, I don't know if it's a mental health thing or just being bitter, but they're maybe now retrapped into life in a sense. But it's it's not to say it's not challenging anybody or ripping anybody apart. It's like I'm here to present what I've done without any ego. You know, I hope I don't come across that way. I'm just stating the facts. A lot of people don't know this because I don't like to speak on it. Um, I've gotten, you know, hundreds of DMs from people since I've been able to open myself up uh, and share that I've been able to somehow, you know, help or they've helped me. We've been able to discuss. So by me sharing, I've been fortunate enough to meet hundreds of people that I never would have met otherwise. That's a big reason I do it. It's not to showcase, hey, look at me, Shan. I'm so amazing. It's to put out an experience that might be relatable or might speak to somebody and get them to actually interact with me. I'm not going to broadcast every single thing and have to explain every single thing. But a lot of the reason I share, I think the biggest reason I share, is to find like-minded people. It's not to toot my own horn. And... Whatever I say, it's the truth. I'm just saying the facts. I never have ever claimed to be the best, or I've never shitted on anybody's experience. You will never see a negative comment on anybody's page or post from Shan, period. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to address that. Like, in two years, again, I've been fortunate to do a ton, and I think rubber tramping is the way to go because it allows you, I believe, to accelerate the experience and it gives you some nice convenience. It eases you in, I think, to the ultimate um, vagabond experience, which is living out of your pet. Did you find there was any difficulty transitioning from, like, the amount of stuff you can have in a car and just the backpack? And what sort of, like, challenges did you encounter? That's, that's a really good question because right now, right now I'm envisioning, <laughs> right now I'm envisioning that moment when my car was towed away in Detroit, and I'm there in a parking lot in the winter with three bags in my name. Um, so I, you know, my car broke down a month into my last road trip from Jacksonville to Las Vegas. Went to Detroit to do urban camping because that's like the abandoned mecca of the world. Car broke down. 
in a parking lot of a park that I was staying at. My entire life was in that because I was moving. My car was packed so everything I owned was in there necessary for a move. So here I am um, trying to figure out what to do with it because sooner or later it's going to get towed. And I'm thinking the best I can do is just, you know, scrap it. We managed to get $500 you know, dollars for 2006 Honda Civic. But the challenge was boiling my life down to carryable packs. I had, you know, three, I had like, I think two backpacks and a duffel bag. And I packed absolutely just the most necessary stuff I felt at that point. Uh, I think because, I don't know, I think because I've gone through a rough childhood and gone through MMA and wrestling, which people don't realize, unless you've done it, you don't realize how many life lessons you learn. And you can relate to this doing combat sports. It teaches you much more than just fighting. It's a mentality that you have. Yeah, I think for coming sure. From a rough, yeah, exactly. So I think coming from a rough background allowed me to transition much smoother um, than I would think. I, I just I just took it in stride, carried around my packs. Um, you know, it wasn't. It's not too difficult. Like I, I can imagine for the average person, I think it'd be a pretty big traumatic moment on average. Yeah. The fact that I have experience in pain or whatever you want to call it allowed me to transition uh, pretty smoothly. And from there, um, I took my packs and flew to Las Vegas and then lost all of them. And at that point, I learned how to consolidate everything into a hiking backpack, a rucksack. You know, something like a 70-liter backpack is what I would recommend. Uh, it's, it's a nice blend of you know, size and uh, being able to just maneuver it around pretty easily. Uh, and then from there, you can always attach a sleeping bag to the outside, although I would rather store a sleeping bag somewhere out in nature near where you want to sleep as opposed to carrying it around. Um, I have, like, different hiding spots that I like to use. So whatever you can't fit in your rucksack, something maybe like you want to carry a sleeping bag or other uh, stuff like that, you can always have kind of what I call a storage area out in the nature, out in the wilderness. Okay. So you can kind of like buffer out the weight while you're doing stuff? What was that again? You can like balance the weight out while you're doing stuff so you don't carry around too much. Some of it's stashed away. Exactly. So in Vegas, uh, it's very tough to to urban camp uh, because there's not really many shrubs being in the southwest. But I was able to find a spot in the park behind this bush. And coincidentally, well, I, I was working um, in the casinos doing recycling, and people would, like, throw their luggage away and stuff like that. So I grabbed one of those rolling luggage things and put it near me, and I would fill that with spare stuff. So if, if I lose it, it's not a big deal, but it became like a closet. I could fill it with clothes, hygiene products, whatever. That's another way of going about it. It's kind of building a, a closet, you know, and, and hiding it away so you can be able to access it for extra stuff. I would always carry my pack. I mean, if you vagabond long enough, you're going to have shit stolen. You want to minimize that by carrying around absolutely the essential stuff. Uh, and I think just having one of these hiking backpacks around, like I, I like a 70 liter, that's kind of my default, is good enough. You should be able to survive off that, so, and that's what I've been doing. And when you, uh, when you had the car there in Detroit break down, was the stuff that you grabbed, like, mainly, like, survival and, like, camping kind of gear? Well, since I was going to Vegas and I knew the weather was going to be warm, I didn't grab so much survival stuff. I think I just grabbed things that, like, I'm trying to think what I grabbed. It wasn't really so much survival. I think it was, like, a lot of sentimental stuff. That I grab, you can always buy, you know, hygiene and survival stuff off Amazon. And I knew it wouldn't be a struggle in Vegas in terms of like enduring the element at that time 
because, you know, winter in Vegas is pretty mild, uh, and I could always grab something quick from Walmart. Like, it, it, it doesn't really take a highly rated sleeping bag. You can get a sleeping bag for 20 bucks any time of year in Vegas, and you're going to be fine. Uh, I think I just grabbed more so, like, sentimental stuff. But again, the first day I ended up losing it, so I had to rebuild from there. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. It was just a, a really weird, very quick succession of going from a rubber tramp to just living out on the streets. So it just you know, boom, and I just had to react. And I think the biggest skill in vagabonding is adaptability. Like, I, I talk about adaptability, survivability, the generic version. It's called the Caso. Pretty cheap on Amazon. I do that. I like the like first person POV style to kind of put you in there. I explore alone, usually at night, and try to give a different perspective. So when I first went to Detroit, first place I went to was a high school. I think it's called Cooney High School. I go there at night. I park. I, I still had my car. Car was still working, so I park my car off to the side of the building. I go in through a window, the, the plywood has been peeled off, go into the window, and you're in this, it's already dark, so it's super dark in there because everything is boarded up. So I, I, I was noticed that even if it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m., it's still dark as hell in there since everything is boarded up. So I go in there, and it's a massive high school. We used to have thousands of students. It's a two-level high school huge auditorium um, and was able to get on the roof pretty easily. Just, you know, there's, you know, a good chunk of land and then it's surrounded by residential areas. So I was there for 12 hours actually because I did my urban exploring. I like to urban explore for about two hours and then I decided to sleep there slept on the roof. I had an inflatable pad and a sleeping bag. And then I, I take like this backpack. It's almost like a survival kit. I, I like to urban explore with a backpack just in case shit goes haywire. Worst case scenario, I'm able to have some sort of essentials. Ended up sleeping on the roof. Uh, the high school also had, it was unique in that it had an indoor track. There's basketball courts, and then up above the basketball courts was this elevated track that went around. That was another new feature. Uh, and when I was urban, this is also one of the few times when I urban explored that there was kind of a weird instance. There was this really weird noise, and a lot of times it's weird. It's like you would think in terms of our survival, if you hear something weird, you want to try to escape from it. There's yeah. something intriguing about it. So I walked more and more towards it, and it was coming from uh, the auditorium. But right when I walked into the auditorium, this freaking figure, this thing in the sky just moved right past me. I, I don't know why, but sometimes you get these crazy thoughts when something hap sudden happens. I thought it was like somebody throwing a ninja star. I don't know why. I don't know why the hell I thought a ninja star would be thrown at me. Uh, but this is something like a, a quick scenario. I eventually ended up seeing uh, an owl perched up in the auditorium. So that was the noise. Huh. And it was a good lesson. Yeah, it was just this owl in the auditorium. Um, but that was one of the rare times in urban exploring, even though I've done a ton of urban exploring, that I come across the scenario that kind of was a little bit uneasy, in a sense. So from from that lesson, what I really gained, since it was my first experience, was the whole concept of like controlling your adrenaline and not letting your thoughts wander too much. In the dark, anything can seem sinister. Any movement could be some sort of crazy ski mask killer or, or a dangerous animal. But you need to be able to reset yourself very quickly and say, like, what are the odds? The odds are so slim of you dying or even exploring that it's not even worth really considering unless you're, you're there, like, unless it's staring you in the face. Um, so for me, that was a very valuable lesson in terms of... Um, 
should be like your mind wandering to maybe like a dark or more sinister place and then realizing there's really not much to it. It's just a normal occurrence. There's always going to be animals in here and stuff like that. The crazy thing is I still haven't experienced an, another person. And again, I've done several dozen massive buildings, dozens of hours, and have not come across another person. Um, that's I think that should be more of like somebody's concern is to have a drugged out person uh, there in unstable and just attacking you for whatever reason. But again, it never happened. That's why really in terms of mainstream, you hear about urban exploring when somebody dies. If they, they're going into a grain silo, the stairs break and they fall 100 feet. That's the only time in mainstream that we're going to hear that, which also means that it's rare because how many of us are out there worldwide doing our thing? Like, it's just unfortunate that you only need, like mainstream only needs to pay attention when somebody dies. But the fact that it's such a rarity points to the fact that I would say it's it's a safe activity if you're just responsible. Fair. What do you think about the guys that do like urban climbing? Oh man, <laughs> it's it's uh for me that's like the most extreme thing. I, mean, I, I got to give it up to the people that do it without any sort of like protection. That's a different level. I personally like I would like to do it in terms of climbing cranes, but wear a safety harness. Which being an electrician in construction, I've worn that a ton of times. I'd be comfortable doing it that way. But for me, there's like a sort of, there's definitely respect, but then also like what the F, like, you know, uh, reaction to people doing, you know, like free climbing like that. I think it's impressive if if that's what you want to do. I don't think anybody should criticize you. If you die that way, you died doing something that you enjoy. Um, so for me, like there's some of the most intriguing videos I've seen these guys just climb up buildings like, how the hell are they doing this? And it's something I definitely want to add to my content, but absolutely not to that extreme. I could not do that. I'm going to be realistic and say that I would love to be like harness crane climbing. Uh, but definitely those guys are something else. And, you know, I enjoy and appreciate the type of stuff they do. Uh, I've seen a ton of stuff like in Eastern Europe or even UAE guys going up and climbing these skyscrapers, you know, cranes and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's just a really, like, unique content area, uh, and it's, it's awesome to see. What about, like, if, like, you're on the crane, right, and you're there by yourself with the harness, and, like, if you slip off and you're suspended, doesn't it, after a certain point, mess you up all the same? You know, yeah, I, I think, so. yeah, I think so. Like, because you're going to cut off circulation to a point, but I believe that means that like gives me a better chance than like obviously fully falling off. Yeah, um, I'd have to look into that. But I, I, I get the double hook harnesses, so I'm always have like a point of contact with whatever I am. I, you also, I, you know, I also have to accept like everybody else that you're gonna, you could potentially die doing this just like train hopping or urban you know just just exploring abandoned buildings there's always going to be that huge risk you know of dying i've been fortunate enough except that incident i told you one of the podcasts trying to escape police from the mall and falling 30 feet into a forest i've been fortunate enough to to have done it safely and i think that's like the default experience like i said before really mainstream only hears the complete negative of some unfortunate death while somebody explodes, let's say something like a grain silo and the stairs break. Um, but other than that, I, I really don't see too much issue. I think too many people are living in such a conservative life. They don't want to take risks. They don't really want to kind of push themselves that everything seems extreme beyond a walk in the park, you know? Yeah, for sure. With the crane, I don't think it would be like too bad because as far as i know they have like catwalks kind of that go all the way to the end like they have parts of them designed yeah, yeah. so you can go on them 
Exactly. Yeah, that's a great point. I just realized that watching them, there is catwalks and stuff, and it makes more sense. People need to maintain that. Workers need to be able to access all these different parts in order to repair and maintain things. Absolutely, that's that's a great point too. Yeah, like I saw some videos. I find the crazy ones are where they just like climb up on like the side of a building or at the top they'll like climb yeah. on like some ornament on the top of a building yeah those are the absolute wildest ones like i i just don't know how you know and any any like minor slip is guaranteed death that's the biggest thing for me that makes me just like sweat watching them they're, they're obviously amazing they know what they're doing but in general, it's not even your fault. Some sort of little rock breaks away or just a little slick surface and that's it. Uh, for me, that's like the ultimate. Like crane climbing is a level below that since you've got so many different like points and maneuver width and stability. But like free climbing these structures um, is just a different level. I, I I don't have the skill, and I never, so therefore I never see myself do it. But I think even if I had the skill, I used to be very reckless growing up, but as you age, you naturally become more conservative. And at this point, like, I, I just don't see the need to take risks. I, I think I have, like, too much to look forward to, to die climbing the side of a building. Yeah, fair. And it's, like, somewhat unnecessary. Exactly. That, that's that's an amazing point. That's why I say, like, whether you do it with a harness or not, you're seeing the same stuff. You're, you're maneuvering in the same way, in a sense. You're, you're experiencing it. You're still experiencing it. Like, ultimately, I want to be able, you're going to see the same views. If you decide to film, the film is going to look the same. I just don't see what I'm really missing out of. The, the risk outweighs the reward in my opinion because in the end like free climbing it it's super impressive but the only additional thing you're going to get is people commenting like oh my god man that's impressive holy crap so really it doesn't come down to like anything extra that's worth it i think you know yeah would you say it's mostly an attention thing or that it's for like the adrenaline rush of it that people do that? No, I, I, I think, I think it's an adrenaline rush. It's too risky to just be solely attention seeking. You know, I think with all these attention seeking, you can in social media. Anytime you post something in essence, you're seeking attention. You want people to be able to see that. Uh, and I guess it's also another criticism that I get at times, it's like I want to share. If I mention certain stuff, I'm not challenging you as if you've never done it. I'm not challenging it as if it's special or tooting my own horn. I'm, I'm just sharing it. So in essence, yes, I am attention-seeking, just like everybody else who posts is attention-seeking in a way. It doesn't, attention-seeking doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. I think the connotation is we put it with all these Vanity posts that are maybe seeking attention for the most shallow and wrong thing. Um, but if somebody wants to do something that has substance to it or has some sort of value uh, to a community, like, why should you rag on that? I, I don't think it's a negative. Uh, yeah, I get where you're coming you know, from. Climbers. Yeah, especially the urban climbers. Like, that's way too much risk to just be attention seeking. You can do attention seeking much, much easier than being a Spider Man. Yeah, for sure. I guess you're saying you'd want to draw the attention to something that actually like matters or has like value to people. Exactly. I think if you have a, if you're attention seeking towards something that has substance, that's totally fine. If you're not claiming that this is like the most wonderful, you're the greatest, you're better than everybody, so be it. You're sharing just like everybody else. How did we get to know about Stove the Hobo? Because he posted those videos. Yeah, you yeah, know? for sure. So, so 
Yeah, he wants those videos to be seen. You can move about his attention seeking. It's not a bad thing. We know about these great vagabonds and we're able to get into vagabonding because other people decided to share about it. How else are you going to know about it? Um, and again, I, like I say, I've been fortunate enough to, to have you know, hundreds of people reach out and interact because I've shared. Just like I was able to get into it because, in a way, Stone, Stone the Homer reached out, Shiny reached out, all these YouTubers, in a sense, reached out to me. And that's how I was able to see it. So for me, the people who shared were the people who actually got me into it. And who knows, maybe I might have that sort of influence over somebody else. That's why I share. It's really a social interaction, ultimately, in my opinion. Do you think social media was, like, a net positive overall? Or that we, like, just as a whole, like, people would be better without it? Uh, it's such a close margin. Like, it's such a close margin. You can call it your way. So, my entire life, I've been on and off social media. I personally hate it. I, if I was not vagabonding, I wouldn't have social media. But I decided that I might as well document my journey. And since I'm documenting it, why not share it? Because those are the people that I believe saved my life. The people who documented and broadcast their journey saved my life. And it was so fun for them to share. I like, why not share my stuff? And also, I, my ultimate thing is to use social media to be social. So I think... The fact that we're able to connect in so many different ways is a net positive. Um, that you're able to have communities and, and, and people who have similar interests be able to connect. I think they are invaluable connections. We can always ignore the rest. We can ignore the negative, you know, the negative sense and the vanity uh, much easier than I would say to throw away all those positive interactions. So really, it's, it's more of like a training method that you can make it totally positive if you're not subscribing to vanity or anything like that. I think it's more of like, you know those books where it's choose your own adventure type of deal? You can choose a path in social media to where there's zero vanity involved. So by personal experience, you're the one that decides whether it's net positive or negative. If you're having, you know... Uh, mental health problems, if you're feeling some sort of negative energy from social media, that means you're doing it the wrong way. So for you, it's a ne ne net negative, but if you're out there, you know, on these social media platforms, connecting with people and, and you're happy, then it's net positive. I believe you can really cater things and have your own experience. It's up to you. You need to take responsibility as to how you interact online. Yeah, I guess you're the one making your environment there, generally. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's, it's such a free-for-all. Like, you have so many options. Um, pick what works for you, and ultimately it's going to be positive. But if you're there competing over who looks the best or who can, you know, dance the best or whatever... I think it's going to be disappointing. But if you're going to be using it to truly connect with like-minded people, it's the most amazing place in the world. How, how else can you better brainstorm than being able to access people worldwide who love what you love as well? Yeah, using it to actually be social. Yeah. So actually... Uh, because we spoke about urban exploring in Detroit. I'll share a couple more stories. Okay. Um, so I did that high school. Because Detroit for me was like the real jump off to becoming an urban explorer. Um, after I did that high school, I did a mall, which does not exist anymore. It was North, Northland, yeah, Northland Mall does not exist anymore. About a month after I was there, in September 2021, it got demolished, and now I believe it's like one of those multi-use apartment buildings where they've got these apartments above some, like, shops below. 
Okay. So, I, yeah, I saw, I, I parked nearby at this bank, and I just watched for about, for, you know, an hour. I noticed there was just one security vehicle going around. It took about 15 minutes for them to go around. So once they went around, I was totally clear, hop the fence. Luckily, I was at the only spot that had an entry or exit. There was this broken glass behind a little bit of plywood that I was able to, to uh, maneuver through. Again, I just it was just luck that I was able to find it that quickly, or else I'd have to scramble across, you know, around this huge mall. It's like 1.5 million square feet, absolutely massive. Um, so I go in there, obviously pitch dark, it's at night. Um, and I've just got my phone as the camera, and I've got this little flashlight. So I go and explore, and it was my first, like, real, uh, I guess, introduction to massive buildings. The high school is huge, but this, like, you know, a mall is just a different level of scale. Um, and for me, that was, like, one of the most exhilarating experiences. It's almost like you have ownership of a huge space. There's, there's like, this weird elevated sense of self um, standing there like I am the only person in this mall. I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. I'm the only person here. Uh, and, you know, like two or three stories. There's all these, you know, all these former stores like Target and stuff like that. There's this food court that had, um, they had like menus and stuff. It was back when Subway was only $5 for a foot long. So it shows you kind of like the age of it, like the good old days of, you know, having cheaper food um, in the food court. Wasn't and that was campaign like, like 2006 oh, or yeah. something? Wasn't the $5 footlongs like the, uh, like a 2006 Subway campaign or something like that? Yeah, I, I think it was, it, it definitely was back in the day. So this mall had been abandoned for a while. Okay. Uh, I, I, I really was just in that last month before they were going to demolish it. Actually, when I was exploring, um, I came upon like some of the main doors, and I look, and I see this construction vehicle. So they were literally just beginning to, to like, initiate the demolition process. There was like a bulldozer outside. There's mounds of dirt and stuff like that. I, I came in like that last month of it still being intact. Uh, I was able to get onto the roof, so that was cool to be able to see kind of the scenery around. I went during that transition period between night and day. I had a couple hours of night of darkness, a couple hours of light. I think that's a nice blend. If I was to suggest urban exploring, I would say access it like you know, an hour, an hour or two before, you know, sunrise or whatever, dawn, and then extend it into that early morning. That way we're able to kind of get a, a blended feel for it. Do you ever find that uh, when you go in at night, your flashlight or however you see might give you away compared to during the day? Great question. Um, I experienced that in my last urban uh, urban exploring the most massive building i have ever done and one of the most massive buildings you know most people will ever come across i believe it was three to four million square feet uh it was the former all-state headquarters in a in the northern suburb of chicago okay and it was in that phase where it got yeah it got bought up by like a reno company for a half a billion dollars so just shows you kind of the scale and value of this place. And there was crews just starting to kind of do demo work, but demolishing it apart. Uh, but it was still fully intact. But there was security, at least one security vehicle, so many windows, being an office building, so many windows. They had a skywalk that must have been like a quarter mile long. And I had to use my light. But I felt like... The odds were in my favor that it wouldn't be seen, or that it would be seen. It's such a massive space, you'll never find me. I think in those scenarios where you're dealing with a huge space and where it's going to be problematic for anybody to find you, 
you shouldn't hesitate. I don't see like a big danger over using your light like that. If you need to be very careful, I would point it straight at the ground in front of you and it's going to be you know harder to see that way. Or use your cell phone, which has a dimmer light, to just kind of shine in front of you. Enough for you to see to maneuver. Uh, but I'm not too kind of concerned. But again, I've never been caught using a light. You know, the times I mentioned before where I got caught was because I was seen or because I was overheard narrating my adventure. Other than that, um, you have to be cognizant if there's, you know, security, certain regions, you know, you don't want to be blessed in your light. But also realize that it's very tough to be caught by security. So it's really, I think, whatever benefits. If you're filming, you want to have clear video, obviously you want to be using your light as much as possible. Right on. Have you ever tried, like, using a different colored light to be less visible? No, actually, no, I've never even thought about that because I think for filming, it would just make sense uh, if you could explain more. Uh, like I know in the military, you use like red lights at night just because it's harder for people's oh, eyes yeah. to see it. But I guess, yeah, for filming, okay. you'd have like a weird hue to all the footage. No, it's, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned it because it's at least another fact I know in something that'd be kind of cool to experiment with. Um, but the vast majority, like, look, this, this is. The, this building I did, the Allstate former headquarters in Chicago, was one of the few buildings that's still guarded. That's why I call it the Stealth Series, because a way for me to expand on urban exploring is doing active sites, sites which still have a presence on them. The other sites don't have anybody there, so I don't think there's like a, a real fear of using like as much light as possible. I think we're going into a more guarded scenario, that's the only time you really got to care. But yeah, you know, it's, it's nice for somebody to be able to mention red lights and, and you know, somebody might benefit listening from this. But it's just, yeah, it's just the more tactics you know, the better overall. And then, let's see, to mention more Detroit urban exploring, well, we this building, I think it's called the, uh, the Fisher, Fisher like, building. I think it used to be like the largest automotive factory in the world at some point back in the 1920s. It was just it's absolutely massive. It just goes on forever. It got caught off by a street in the middle. Okay. But if you want to, yeah, if you want to, you know, call it urban decay, that's exactly what it was. It was absolutely beat up. A lot of floors were caved in. There's really just a massive open space. Um, I don't think it's good for filming. At night, I would suggest for me, this is what I've been doing, like after that, is film factories in wide open spaces only during the day. That way you can actually see some scenery, or else you're not really going to see much. Like filming open spaces at night is, is not that intriguing. And that was the first time I, I realized that factory filming needs to be during, not during the day. Um, that was the other experience. And then, let's see, what else did I do there? I did, oh, I did the hospital, which I actually slept on top of. That was my spot in Detroit. I think it was like South Coast Community Hospital or something like that. It was near kind of an intersection of two highways. And on the rooftop, you could see the skyline of Detroit. And on the other side, you could see the Ambassador Bridge to Canada, to Windsor. That was a very cool spot just because of that scenery, especially, you know, when, when the sun was rising. At the very top was a mechanical room. We call it a penthouse. And I, uh, I still had my car, and I was able to, um, I think, what was it, like, four or five stories. I like to use this roll-up mattress topper. Um, I took it to the top, rolled up my mattress topper. I had like this nice uh, Tempur-Pedic pillow. I think the pillow was like $90, $100. I really invested in that. 
I had some blankets, and I just left it up in that penthouse. Yeah, I slept there because I was spent the winter in Detroit of 2021, and that was one of my main spots I used to sleep at was on top of this event hospital. But then crews started coming in. The building was had signs that it was up for lease or whatever. Um, and near the end, there was more and more of a presence there, so that's why I left. Um, again, this building was gutted out. If you didn't realize it was a hospital before, you would think it's a parking structure since there wasn't much to it. Again, the fact that if you're going to be exploring the abandoned places and you want to, like if you want to explore wide open spaces and you want to film, do so during the day or else you're really not going to see much. Um, this was essentially just a five like story parking garage. Uh, but it was one of the times that I found um, like a great opportunity to be able to sleep. And also had a wireless security uh, system. There was only one way to get up. Therefore, it was very convenient for me to be able to position, position stuff. And if anybody came, I'd have a very easy alert. You know, thankfully nobody came. And uh, yeah, that was one of the good spots. How does that work, the uh, wireless security system? There's this one, like, there's this unit, that's the one that transmits the alarm or sound. And I have that near me, and you can hook up to 50 sensors, and they hook up automatically. And you can put them out to, like, 300 feet, I believe. Uh, so I just positioned those in the stairwells. And again, that's the only way people are going to get up. And I've used that in a variety of, you know, uh, scenarios. I would absolutely recommend it to people, especially if you're starting out, you're going to be much more nervous. As you become more experienced and you realize that there's really not as many threats as your imagination thinks, you're going to kind of relax. Um, just like right now, I'm totally comfortable. I can sleep wherever out in the open. Like I'm, at, I'm talking to you at a park right now under a covered shelter. I'll just lay down here, you know, and have no issues with it because I've got to know the area. You know, the first couple of nights, I recommend being awake and alert. It, it kind of suck, but that's kind of how you know the area. So being out, out there in a abandoned building on top of a hospital, who the hell is going to come there? Um, it's just, again, we let our, we kind of suffer more in our imagination. We, we envision all these demons and crazy stuff. Really, nobody wants to do that. The rarity of being an urban explorer, it's like, come on. Who, who, who wants to, you know, venture in these places? And the people that venture are not going to be violent. They, they just want to explore. They're going to be real people. You're literally going to come across your people if you come across anybody else at all. Um, so that was one of the sleepiest spots in Detroit. Again, I spent the winter there. Brutal stuff, uh, you know. Winter... Before this one, you know, wait. Last winter in Chicago, the winter before that, so I've, I've just experienced the Great Lakes winter, which are brutal. The other spots I slept, well, the best one I found was at Motor City Casino in the parking garages. I think we talked about this where you mentioned the stairwell parking garages. But that yeah. was my... I, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, yeah, you mentioned... Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. You mentioned that the parking garage stairwells, right? Yeah. They're pretty good for like a night or two. Yeah, so for me, that was very early on what I learned to use. And some of them even have outlets, um, like the ones I found in Vegas. It was awesome. And I was able to get to know the security and they let me stay there. That was just like a, a great opportunity. But in Detroit... Motor City Casino was one of the solid spots I found. And what I found was first first under the stairwell, um, but then the better spot in one part of the parking garage, they would part they would put like all of their extra chairs and tables and stuff like that. And there was this couple foot gap in, in the back. Okay. When I slept in the stairwell and just maneuvering in the, in the casino, I never saw anybody go back there. It was kind of like this place they just threw things and didn't really like go back to, to check anything. 
so I slept on a piece of plywood and I used the a chair cushion as my um, pillow. <laughs> That's when I was my most just like lonely moment, sleeping with my clothes on some plywood and using the chair cushion as a pillow. And this is during the winter, so it's getting below freezing weather. Thankfully, the casino is open 24 hours a day and they had free soda and free coffee. Uh, I would, you know, totally go in there and, and sit down and watch sports and drink, you know, soda and coffee. That was a nice thing. That was also when I got COVID twice. But thankfully, there was an ambulance there. Um, illnesses are exaggerated when you're, you're being a vagabond when you're homeless. I think for me, if I was housed and just laid on the couch for a couple of days or whatever, I'd be fine. When you're sleeping on plywood, using a chair cushion as a pillow in, in the low freezing weather, the stuff is going to hit you especially hard. Um, you know, so I had to go to the hospital for COVID a couple of times from there. Um, the one crazy kind of story that happened in Detroit, the one time, like I, I always sleep outside. I sleep outside in a sleeping bag on the concrete or on whatever surface, whatever. Like, it works for me. I don't care what anybody thinks. It works for me. It's comfortable enough. I rarely, I've only used the tent once. That was in DeKalb, Illinois. It was snowy. Put it out in the woods. It worked. So I just adapt to what... I just do the least needed to be able to be comfortable. But when the police took me from Dearborn, Michigan, to Detroit... Uh, because they found me staying in a parking garage. Again, taking out the trash, uh, they didn't want me in Dearborn, so I'm going to throw you in Detroit. They're like, we're going to drop you off at this homeless shelter in downtown Detroit. I think it's called Detroit Rescue Mission. I okay. went in there, got registered, but I think that was the first time I'd experienced a shelter and I knew it wasn't for me. They're crowded in there with a bunch of people that don't give a crap. They don't care about their hygiene. They don't care about their future. They're just there to, to survive. Um, so I went in there for about a day. And then the second day, and also they have a lot of rules. Like you've got to be in by 5 p.m. If you're not in by 5 p.m., you're not allowed to have a bed. So I think the second day there, I was going out and about trying to explore downtown. And that's how I found Motor City Casino, which was nearby. And when I came back, it was too late, and they're like, you know, like, you can't stay here the night. And I told them, you know what? No, no. Also, you had to throw all your stuff into a clear bag, and they had to examine every single piece of thing every night that you entered with. Again, I didn't have anything crazy, but I felt like it's such an exaggerated routine, in my opinion. It was so much of a hassle. So what, I can sleep three inches from a random ass guy it, it wasn't comfortable at all you know even though all the, you know the temperature was great compared to a winter outside of detroit that was the first time you know i said f it i'm going to go on my own i think the first spot i went i slept in a again a parking garage of a local college i think the wayne state university in detroit i slept in a parking garage there that was the first spot i found uh, once I decided the shelter wasn't for me. And then from there, that's when I found more so the, uh, the parking garage at the casino. But when I went into the shelter the first day, I'm eating, sitting by myself, and this one guy comes up to me. Um, he introduces himself. He's like, yeah, you seem a little bit different or whatever. And he's this older, artsy, music type and whatever, and we kind of roam around town for a while, but I just notice there's just something weird, like, this guy gets way too high too often, and he talks too much about himself. I'm the type of person that I'd kind of sit back, and I'd rather listen to people in a sense, in general, but I just got this vibe of narcissism, um, where he was just always talking about himself, there's always drama. I can handle that for a bit, but after a while, it was too much. So I, you know, found ways to disconnect. Um, so when I was sleeping in the parking garage at Motor City Casino, 
he was texting me about, oh, his brother has access to food. Do you want this? And I was like, hey, yeah, sure, I'll take some food. But then he never responded. And I noticed that was kind of a pattern of offering certain things and then never following through. And at that point, I fully just blocked this guy and said, like, screw you. Um, he was the only person to know about my stuff under the stairwell. I had, like, these pos my possessions were under the stairwell. I come back the next day and, like, the valuable stuff I had, my power packs and stuff, was stolen, and everything else was thrown across the entire stairwell. Uh, so I think that was, like, an act of revenge, which is a warning to people, like, in general, I would not trust most people who are out on the streets. Um, I think... It should be more of a kind of a lonely journey. It's rare to find good people. So kind of keep your guards up because, again, this is kind of a harsh lesson I learned by involving myself with, you know, somebody else that it came back to bite me. And was that the only person you interacted with while you were there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was the only person, you know. So I... And, and, you know, they were they were from Detroit. They're gracious. They would get me food or this and that. But I think ultimately, in a way, um, it was self-serving to them, you know, and I was the one that ended up paying in the end when I decided, like, I don't want to deal with you. They were like, screw you. Get out of my life. And, you know, they had enough info on me that they could somehow get back at me. So I think that's why, especially as a vagabond, you have to be extra cautious as to who you deal with. And ultimately, in a sense, it sounds weird, but you're not being rude. Again, I tell this to, you know, I'm just kind of announcing this to people who are hearing this. You're not rude by not revealing where you're staying, you know. Whoever asks you, I would never reveal my location to anybody you know, unless they are the most trusted person on earth to me, there's, you, do, you do not owe anybody any information. If somebody gets offended by that, fuck them. Like, what do they have to gain by knowing your location except if they want to access it or whatever? So I learned my lesson that way that it doesn't matter how chill or cool somebody is, Unless they go through that process of being a true friend, there's no benefit to knowing where you're going to be sleeping with. So do not reveal your location. I don't care how nice somebody is, because the nicest people on earth are con artists. You have to be very careful. Have you ever had any other similar interactions with people on the road? No, I think I think that was my first and last time because I learned my lesson briefly. Um, I do meet, being a vagabond, that's kind of like the funny, interesting thing. You meet so many uh, eccentric characters, and that's part of the journey, and it's fun if you take it for that. And from then on, I just learned to not take people so deeply. It's like, okay, cool, you're whatever, an NPC in my life. It's entertaining. You serve this purpose. But I'm not going to let you deep into it to where we're, like, we're interacting on a daily basis. There's no need for you to ever know where I'm staying. And that's that. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. You need to be able to learn from your lessons. When we're talking about net positive or, or negative or whatever, you can, this vagabond thing is what you make of it. If you're going to keep making poor decisions, if you're the type that feels like you owe people something, it's going to be a very bad experience. You're going to be taking advantage left and right. You're already in a very vulnerable position. You're going to make yourself more vulnerable by giving people details that don't need to know details. So I would say, if anything, be guarded. This is a personal experience. Focus on yourself. Focus on what is best for you. This is not a time, I don't think, you know, to be interacting over you need to be you're very choosy about each interaction i just i don't see the value in, in I, I think just talking too much about specifics is, could come back to haunt you 
Yeah, fair. Especially just meeting strangers. Like, I think even if you have a house and you just talk to someone for 30 minutes, they should know where you live, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and I think a lot of people, like, the, the more sinister people, they have a very great talent and skill at guilt tripping you as if you're the wrong one for not revealing personal information. And in the end, you're thinking, no, like, you're the rude one for asking. If anything, you're the one that's being negative. You're the one that's doing the wrong thing. Um, so for me, I would be on guard since, like, that's just not, you know, a normal thing to ask. If somebody's crying for information, you have to be aware that maybe there is more to it and that, you know, they're there to take advantage in some way. So, yeah, I definitely would be very cautious. But again, I don't want to give this impression that Vagabonding should just be a very solo, um, Spartan existence. Uh, I think the more, I, th I really think the experience factor factors into how you're able to read people. So when I talk about being two years in, I could have experienced anything anybody could have done in a hundred years. It just depends on what you're doing during that time. But I think experience in terms of years matters more in terms of reading people in developing that gut feeling. The instinct. I really think it's the instinct where you benefit from years being outside. Being a vagabond, I really think it's the instinct factor that gets developed over the years. Um, and that's kind of what you learn, uh, with your gut feeling. Out of all the places that you've been in the U.S., where would you say is the, uh, the most, like, the best overall? And what would the reasons for that be? Um, so for me, I, I like South Dakota, Rapid City, South Dakota. It's just outside the Black Hills Forest which is where Mount Rushmore is located. Uh, Sturgis is on one end. It's famous for motorcycles. You drive through the forest, heading east, and then you end up out of the woods into a rapid city. I would say for me, that's the best region. It's something I want to explore more. It was just like so clean and pristine. There's so many cool attractions right off the highway, like the main freeway. I forget what, what, what it's called like a lot of Native American and stuff like that, um, attractions. I would say that's the best spot. The big negative is during the winter, it's brutal weather. That's why I don't want to, like, relocate up south. Other than that, I believe, for me, like, the best is, is the southwest, which is why I'm technically a Vegas resident. Nevada resident, that's where I want to relocate is Las Vegas. Um... So I would say, like, yeah, I would definitely recommend people to check out the Dakotas. I really had, like, a nice experience during the summer. I would say check out the Dakotas. Um, if you've been exploring the Great Lakes, I would check out Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland. Uh, Pittsburgh is pretty nearby to there. Those are great regions. So if you want to be urban exploring, the best thing for your buck is to be in the Great Lakes. Um, and Cleveland... Is actually my top spot. It's kind of weird, but I did six places there. Most of the factories. That's the big thing with the Great Lakes. All of that manufacturing there, um, that with the recession has been broken down, is going to leave the remnants. Makes sense. Um, I did a few factories there. Let's see. I did a couple schools. Nothing that was like. Stands out as too crazy, um, but that's where I learned that we should be filming factories and open spaces during the day. Um, it's funny, yeah, Detroit was my actual like, top spot, but again, I plan to go back to Detroit. I just I missed out because the, the first time I didn't have a head cam, the second time I didn't have any cam. That's the time that when my car broke down, I definitely like you will be back to Detroit in filming spots. It sucks I wasn't able to film that mall that I told you about, but there's so many places. If you go, just Google Detroit abandonment or malls or whatever, 
shit is closing every month. Um, there's just so many opportunities there for people to take advantage of. If you want to have like the ultimate urban exploring experience in America or maybe North America, I would say take a trip to the Great Lakes, just follow the border and hit up those major cities and see what's up. Right on. Do you think we'll see more cities like Detroit popping up with just a bunch of abandoned, like, strip malls and stuff like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Guaranteed. Since everything seems to be transitioning to online, it makes sense that the brick-and-mortar stores are going to be going out of business. I see so much more opportunities for urban exploring um, around the world, especially the but they're going to be dinosaurs since there's so many better deals on Amazon and stuff like that. In a way, it excites. In a way, it excites me. First of all, I'm getting better deals online, and second of all, I'm getting better opportunities to explore in the real world. Uh, I mean, I, I feel bad for those people that are losing out on jobs. I'm just speaking from from my perspective of being an urban explorer and a vagabond. I want abandonment, you know, and uh, the economy is playing right into that. Yeah. Do you think, uh, like, what do you think of all these analysts saying that, like, the recession hasn't even really started yet and that things are going to get a lot more expensive? I, I truthfully haven't paid attention to, like, mainstream news. You know, here's, like, certain events. Unfortunately, the, the mass shooting in Maine, stuff like that catches my attention just because it's blasted everywhere. Again, negativity is what rules the information age for whatever reason. Um, but I definitely think that, like, the real downturn hasn't started. Like, we're seeing a majority of the population, I think, is living paycheck to paycheck which is scary because if you have something major, you could be put on the streets. And we're talking about families with young children out there having to fend for themselves. Thankfully, we do have a lot of services, but people have too much confidence in these services. So a lot of them, they take a lot of time to act. Um, we, I, I just, we, we have like this idealistic, the people who haven't experienced homelessness, or being out on the streets, have this idealistic view that you're going to be saved quickly. You don't realize how fast you can devolve into being a strong-out drug addict who's disconnected from the world, living, you know, inside a bush. Just, you know, it, it's that's the sad part. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, so no, I, I don't think the worst is yet to come. I think we're going to see much worse stuff as like the, the inequality uh money making like the, the income inequality is just going to be further exaggerated we're going to see way more people on the streets i've already seen it the thing is we're bringing so many immigrants into the country refugees the fact that those people who are essentially fully taken care of because you're not going to bring somebody a government is not going to bring somebody from a different country and be like, yeah, you're going to come to America and be homeless. No, we're going to we're going to guarantee them that there's stability there, stability here. When you start seeing migrants, immigrants, refugees out on the streets being drug addicts, you kind of that's that's a big sign in my opinion. I'm seeing more and more here in Seattle of people who come from different countries via our government action. And here they are out on our streets. It's like, what's the point? That kind of shows you how bad stuff is getting. Uh, that's kind of my metric to measure. And kind of my rant about that is another way I see things falling and devolving is the fact that citizens are getting less and less uh, preferential treatment. In terms of like, you know, me going into a food bank and having to wait there forever, and when I do get in, there's really nothing left. In my opinion, it makes sense, you know, when I when I talk to somebody about, hey, like, I'm an American citizen, I have nothing. I'm not getting any sort of, like, food assistance. 
why can't I have some sort of like access to X, Y, Z? And they're like, well, you didn't consider the immigrants feeling. I'm like, these people are coming here voluntarily. Like, what? I, I told them, what is the point in being a citizen then? It just seems like more and more services and preferential treatment is given to outsiders. Do they, do they need help? Absolutely. But I'm kind of at this point where I see less and less treatment, like preferential treatment for citizens, where I'm thinking, what is the point? And that kind of, kind of alludes to maybe a more sinister agenda of these governments. I don't know what it is. It just doesn't make sense that a lot of these homeless services are being dominated by immigrants. I saw an example in Chicago uh, where I met with this caseworker, and I was just asking him basic stuff like, how can I have free laundry and this and that? I, I never cared for shelter. I feel like a guy like me seeking shelter or permanent housing um, is, is stealing in a sense because there's people that need it more. I'm doing this a lot of, you know, voluntarily, uh, going on the streets and exploring. But he was like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. A lot of these things I can't provide because the migrants we brought in are totally taking up the facility. Uh, they're, they're putting people on the streets. Like, our citizens are being put on the streets in parts because a lot of these shelters are turned into immigrant, you know, housing, uh, like temporary housing while we figure out the solution. And uh, but again, it's, this has nothing to do with racism or whatever. I just see that as being like, I don't know, it's just that, it's such a sad case, an angry case, and people don't realize the issue until you're on, you're on the streets and you need services, and you're told that non-citizens are taking up those spaces. That's when you realize that dystopian future is more so coming when you as a citizen are not even able to access stuff because others from halfway across the world are getting um, treatment ahead of you. Yeah, and you are the one that paid the taxes that are put into these services. Exactly. exactly. So it's and that's what I've experienced a lot in being a vagabond, homeless, whatever you want to call it. I've experienced a shocking amount of second-class treatment. I've, I've seen, I, I swear and I guarantee, in my opinion, if you're homeless or vagabond in this country, the people halfway across the country that are brought here will receive better treatment than me, 100% guaranteed. They'll get better respect, because everybody's going to be sympathetic to them, you know. Oh my God, you're in a war zone. And this and that, like the people are our own citizens. I could, I'm sure even Canadian citizens or whatever um, can relate to the fact that hey, if you're on the streets or vagabond long enough, you're a second class citizen. These immigrants or migrants or whatever refugees come in, guaranteed they get the sympathy, they get maximum treatment, they get quick. These, how the fuck do you come into a brand new country? You've already got a car, you've got housing. You've got all these benefits. You've got a job. You've got a caseworker looking after every goddamn step you take. How the fuck are you getting this? Like, I'm sorry to cuss, but how are how do these people have a streamlined process? And there's people here. We've got fucking veterans out on the streets. How is that acceptable? How is somebody who is willing to fight and die for their country? I'm not talking about myself. But how are these people who are willing to ultimately sacrifice for a country not even able to get or struggle for basic services? And you can bring some motherfucker from a different country and they get everything automatically. You don't even have to do anything. There's no effort. These guys, I talk to veterans, a lot of my friends are in the military. They, they talk about the hassle of going through all these agencies. There's a late medical care by months. Like, some of these people are going to die in those couple months um, because of their, you know, medical conditions from a lot of them serving in the military. And you're going to bring somebody halfway across the world and give them a car. Like, these, these, these refugees are driving in, in, in new cars to the food bank. And I'm walking with a goddamn beat-up pack to 
just get some food that I have zero benefits. This is the only way I can access it. And I speak for many other people. It's, uh, there's something sinister about it. Like there's no other explanation. It makes no sense at all. The, the, the public does not know unless they hear my, pers you know, like a perspective from my end. But I don't, you're not going to hear a homeless or vagabond perspective. We're already second rate. That's why I'm so big on me doing social media and broadcasting because this is what I think people need to hear. It's not going to hit hard unless somebody speaks with validity on the subject. Um, you know, somebody coming from my background where I'm established in the real world, I struggled um, and I've done whatever it takes to, to have those accomplishments in the real world to be respected enough to be heard. But then I've also got this kind of underworld experience that I can combine into, you know, a perfect blend of giving reality. I'm going to give the good and the bad, but I think a lot of stuff is understated in terms of what the outsiders can gain, the convenience that they have compared to people who are here who have paid their taxes, who are supposed to get preferential treatment. There's nothing racist or whatever about being born in a place and saying, like, yeah, you're born here, therefore there's benefits to being here, or else why the fuck would I want to be a citizen? There's no point in being a citizen of anything or being part of it. Why would I want to be part of a group unless I gain benefit from it, right? Um, that's just my opinion. You know, it might come across as harsh or whatever, but a lot of times there's so much political correctness that people can't really voice that I believe is, is ultimately the truth, you know? But at least I can make a talking point, right? If you disagree with me, that's fine. You can bring up your points. You, they may be valid points. I'm willing to hear it. But don't knock on me for, you know, saying what I believe. And, again, what I believe, I've experienced. Anything I broadcast about vagabonding or being homeless, I've experienced. If I talk about surviving, why? I'm still surviving. Whatever I've done works. It may, not, it may not be the most ideal thing. It may not work for you, but it works. So I'm just really here to speak the truth. Everything I say is backed um, by, you know, some sort of action that I've taken that's been successful for me. Uh, and, uh, again, political science major, that's what I graduated with. I think it speaks to something. It matters to something. Um so, yeah, again, I really appreciate you having me on a podcast because it's the best way for me to be able to kind of expand on everything I post on social media. So, again, really appreciate you just willing to listen and, and, and broadcast it. You don't have to agree with it. There's, there's, this has nothing to do with anybody else giving, like, consent about what I say. But just allowing somebody to be able to speak their mind, I think, is a very powerful and secure feeling. Yeah, I generally agree with everything you've said, um, but also if someone's opinion differs, I'm more than open to hear it and still put it out there on the podcast, because I feel like even if someone has, like, a misguided idea, it's better to have it out there, so then anyone that disagrees or yeah. finds evidence against it can prove, can present their point, you know? You're 100, exactly, and that's my exact belief when I mentioned, I could learn from that. How many times have I learned from people who disagreed with me that were able to, like, convey things better? Because a lot of times, we may disagree with something just because it's not worded right, because the person trying to argue is not good at articulating it. Um, so it gives me opportunity as well to learn from people. That's why I open. I'm open to it. Again, I have a lot of love and sympathy for people across the world. Um, my parents were immigrants. Yeah, they did it the legal way, sure, but they came here because they wanted a better life. So I, I understand everybody who comes here. If you were given the opportunity from a third world country to come to a first world country, of course you're going to take it. Like, I don't blame you for doing that. It's more like I, I'm talking about our own system. I'm not shitting on people because I do the same thing. I'm going to maximize every damn benefit I get. 
I'm just kind of pointing to our system and how I feel like unless you're really needing the system to work for you, you're not going to realize how messed up it is. Yeah, for sure. Well, it was great having you on. And that concludes episode 24 of the Moon Base podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode, which, like I said in the intro, will probably be uh, the evasion reading. And don't forget to check out the Patreon uh, if you want to support the podcast and whatnot.